Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday evening Bible study. Just give you everyone a second to join with us here this evening. So thankful to be in the presence of the Lord. So thankful to be with all of you in the presence of the Lord this evening. Man, what an incredible time that we've been having on Sunday mornings. These past couple of weeks have just been an incredible moving of the Holy Ghost. And we're just so thankful for what God is doing through all of what's going on. And I, I know we've said it before, but I don't think we can say it enough, just how incredible the Lord is that through the midst, in the midst of all this chaos and confusion and junk that's going on in our world, we just happen to be having better moves of God. We've been, the Spirit of the Lord is doing incredible things. And so as the world gets worse, the church is continuing to do better. And the Holy Ghost is continuing to move in new and unprecedented ways. And I'm so excited to see what the Lord has in store for us. I'm so thankful and excited to see what the Lord has in store for this church. And I'm so excited to see what the future holds for the kingdom of God. Amen. And if you didn't uh, get last, uh, this past Sunday, we did live stream the, the preaching on this past Sunday as well as the week before and they were just some incredible messages that we wanted to share with as many people as possible. But uh, especially this past week, if you, if you have anybody that you're thinking about sharing at least one of these messages with, I, I think this past service on Sunday morning with Brother Frankfurt preached to us was such a relevant topic to literally anybody that you want to share that with. And I'm just so thankful that the Lord moved through that and spoke to us. And if you, again, if you if you pick something to share, that would that would definitely be a great candidate to do that for. But God is speaking to us, and I'm so thankful for what He is speaking into this church. I'm so thankful for this next few weeks of Bible studies. I think there are going to be some incredible things that you're not going to want to miss. Um, so thankful the church is moving on. Amen. Uh, just real quickly in the way of announcements, do want to. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, let you know that we are continuing in our schedule as we have been doing it. So Facebook Live on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. as regularly scheduled. And Sunday morning services will be here in the building at 10 a.m. And we are uh, continuing to forego the Sunday evening service for the time being. So schedule as is for right now. This Sunday will be our next last Sunday of the month and so we are going to try to get together with our youth as we would normally do on the last Sunday of the month after the morning service so just as a reminder of that I know time's been kind of blurring together but it is last Sunday of the month again uh, coming up this Sunday um, I do want to mention again Sheaves for Christ we have another month or so to be able to give to that Again, if you're able, I know there's been a lot of people bringing in these cans and filling them up. It's been such an incredible thing, and I, I, it's a blessing when you can do that and give to Sheaves for Christ. But just a reminder, there's more cans up here. There's also uh, alternate ways of giving. We have the envelopes in the back for when you're here. You can designate money to Sheaves for Christ. We do still have our online giving as well. And you can go to apostolicfaith.com and get that info as well as any other up-to-date info that we are providing through that. Amen. Praise God. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer here this evening before we get into the Word of God and ask for Him to prepare our hearts for what we have to hear this evening. Jesus, I thank you Lord, for your people. You, I thank you, Jesus, for the sincerity Hallelujah, of your people. I thank you, Lord, for the love that we feel when we come together in the presence of the Lord. I thank you for the authority of the Holy Ghost. I thank you for the power and the anointing of your word. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would prepare us tonight for what you have to speak to us. Lord, I know that there is an incredible word that you have to say to us tonight, and I just ask that our hearts would be open to receive not only what you're saying in these topics through these next few weeks, but I pray, Lord, that it would be taken personally, Lord, that, that, that we would feel something and know something and understand something about our own personal walk with you through these Bible studies, that our spirits would be open and receptive 
and be able to respond appropriately to conviction and respond appropriately to the word of God. I ask, Lord Jesus, that your spirit would move in our midst tonight as we go into the word of the Lord. I ask, Lord Jesus, that there would be healing that goes forth tonight, those that are sick, those that are struggling with things tonight. I ask for your spirit to go forth and to bring healing and to restore and to make whole that the Spirit of the Lord and the Word of God would uplift us tonight and bring healing and restoration in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask it and we claim it and believe all things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Josh. We appreciate you so much. And thank you, everybody, church family, for your support and faithfulness to the kingdom of God. And uh, God is doing great things. We're excited about what the Lord is doing in spite of some of the challenges that we've been facing. God's still doing great things. And, and we know the Lord is able to bring us through. And he is able to give us victory. And uh, we thank the Lord for that tonight. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 5. I'm going to read a text of Scripture, and uh, I have another series we're going to start for the next couple weeks. Uh, we've been teaching on some heavy-duty stuff, and, um, and I feel like maybe we'll lighten the, lighten the load a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about uh, being a witness for Jesus. Uh, it is very important to us as Christians, and especially as disciples, followers of Jesus, that we are a witness for Him. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So if you have your Bible and you'd like to turn uh, with me to the book of Luke chapter 5, I'd like to read verses 1 to 10. It came to pass that as the people pressed upon Him to hear the Word of God, He stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and He saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were going out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships that was Simon's, that's Peter, and prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. I'd just like to pause and say that Peter obviously had not known the Master very long. But just sitting there as Jesus taught from the ship, listening to the words that he spoke, obviously inspired Peter enough that when Jesus said, Go out and let down your nets for a draft. Uh, and it is draft. Some people say draught. A draught is when you don't get something, like it's not raining. Uh, a draft is actually a pretty big amount. Uh, so what Jesus was prophesying is if they let down their nets, they would catch a lot of fish. And notice Peter's response, obviously inspired by the things Jesus had been teaching and saying. He said, we, we fished all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, we'll just do it because you ask us to. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, and they should come and help them. And they came and filled both of the ships, so that they began to sink. I'm telling you, that is a draft of fish. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord." For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draft of fishes that they had taken. And so was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said, Simon, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Hallelujah. When they brought their ships into the land, they forsook all, and they followed him. I want to talk to you for the next couple of Bible studies on the subject of fishers of men. It was this statement Jesus makes in Luke chapter 5. Don't be afraid. What you've witnessed is a miracle, but there's something even greater. Because henceforth, 
You shall catch men. Hallelujah. You shall catch men. I want to talk about being fishers of men. So there's a lot of focus on the healings and the miracles of Jesus. Uh, there are books written about his parables and his teaching and indeed the Gospels. Their record of the powerful ministry of Jesus Christ and the magnitude of his marvelous works have not even all been told. In fact, John records this in 21, chapter uh, 21 of John, his gospel, verse 25. John says, And there are many, also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they would be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So John says, even what you see in the Bible and the records that we have of what Jesus did, we can't even begin to record all the things that he did because the world wouldn't hold the books of all the deeds. So with all the focus on what Jesus did, it would be over, uh, easy to overlook the purpose of why he did it. With all the things that he did, easy to overlook why he did it. And I would submit to you tonight that a careful examination of each miracle and each healing, every devil casting outing, uh, every teaching, every preaching, every mentoring will reveal that the true motivation behind everything Jesus did was to reach souls. To reach souls. His purpose in all that he did was to reach the lost with that message of hope and salvation. So let me just say, early on here, that, that the goal of every Christian, the goal of every church, the goal of every ministry and every minister, the goal of every singer and musician, every teacher, regardless of what you might be doing for church, or the church, or the kingdom of God, the number one purpose it's, it's not so much what you do for the kingdom, but it's why you're doing it. And the why of what we're doing is to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we could truly get the heartbeat of God, if we could truly get the heartbeat of God and know that that is what he cares about more than anything else is reaching the lost, then we would become more successful in reaching people and growing churches filled with people who love Jesus and who want to do the same, and that is to reach somebody else with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Luke records one of the last things that Jesus says before entering into Jerusalem for the final time. It's in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, and again supports the reason why Jesus was doing everything he was doing. It's really a, um, a prophetic insight to what would happen next. Uh, because after this statement, he, Jesus heads to Jerusalem. And he had avoided Jerusalem for some time. He had avoided going to the city because he knew that the next time he went into Jerusalem, it would be for the last time. He knew that when he came to Jerusalem, Herod would be looking for him. He knew that the Pharisees were looking for him. Uh, so he knew, and when, when he uttered these final words that Luke records, he headed to Jerusalem. And when he got there, he said, the hour is come. He knew what time it was. I, I hope, I hope you as the church know what time it is. Uh, and I don't mean like right now, 20 after 7, uh, you're going to be timing me how long I'm going to be teaching tonight. And what time you got to get to bed and get up and go to work tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm not talking about that time, but I'm talking about the time it is in the Spirit, what hour it is, and I believe we're living in the last days. We need to know what time it is. Jesus says these words, Luke records them in Luke 19 and 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And with that, he heads toward his destiny of the cross. Now, we know that his death, burial, and resurrection uh, were the purchase of our salvation. Aren't you? Come on, are you thankful tonight that Jesus died 
on the cross for you. That the blood that was shed, I'm not going to spend time on that tonight. We've taught Bible studies and you want to know a little bit about the, the dynamics and the purpose of the cross. I'll, I'll be glad to sit down and do some Bible study with you on that. Uh, but Jesus gave his life on the cross at Calvary. He shed his precious blood so that we might be saved. He fulfilled all the prophecies of Scripture uh, so that all could be accomplished, that you and I might have this great salvation. He was buried in a tomb, and for three days and three nights he lay there in state. <laughs> but on the third day, on the third day, amen, the stone rolled away, and he walked out of that tomb victorious over death, hell, and the grave. His resurrection was the culmination of what he had come to do to save man from this insalubrious world and to reach us with this gospel message of his great resurrection power. And perhaps more important than what Jesus said before the crucifixion is what he said after the resurrection. For 40 days he was upon the earth and showed himself to many people. And in that 40 day period, uh, he left some of the most uh, impacting statements to the disciples and to those who would hear him. Um, they, they assumed that the miracle of the resurrection had signaled the beginning of an earthly kingdom. Well, they had assumed correct, but they had perceived incorrectly because they thought it would be more of a natural kingdom. It was going to be more of a, a political kingdom. Uh, they thought it was going to be an earthly kingdom. Uh, but the kingdom that began with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and would later be brought to fruition uh, through His ascension and the ultimate outpouring of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost was a heavenly kingdom on earth. A kingdom not of this world. Uh, Jesus says this to Pilate during His trial. Uh, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my, my people would rise up and fight. But that's not what we're about. Hey, listen, we're not about fighting with the people of the world. Right. We're not about fighting with the politicians. We're not about fighting with the special interest groups. Mm -hmm. I believe we need to take a stand. Sure. Right. We need to stand for what's right. We need to stand for what's Bible. We need to stand for what's good. And we need to do it smart. I think there's a lot of preachers, a lot of our leaders in the United Pentecostal Church uh, that are doing some good things and some right things, and they're standing up in the right ways. But Jesus made it clear that this is not an earthly kingdom. And we are a heavenly kingdom, a heavenly priesthood, a heavenly people. And this kingdom that started at Pentecost uh, is a kingdom that still fills the earth with hope today because of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so the things Jesus says after the resurrection become very, very important. They're His final words, His parting words, uh, His words that signal the most significant thing that he wants them to remember after he ascends up into glory. And, and I'd like to read a couple of those uh, verses of Scripture, if I could, to you. Uh, you can jot them down and, and refer back to them uh, later, but I'd like to read a couple of them for you. <clears throat> the first one, obviously, is found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Uh, he talks to them about being witnesses, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And we know that name is Jesus. That's the name he was referring to. Uh, we see later in these contexts that he makes it very clear that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Jesus, beginning at Jerusalem. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 18, this is what Mark records as his final words. He said, Go ye into all the world... And preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. How many know tonight that if you're going to be baptized, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Very clear. That's what happened in Acts 2.38. They began to baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ. The first message of salvation. Uh, Jesus goes on to say, He that believeth... Uh, shall, uh, he that believeth shall be saved, and he that baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. In my name they're going to speak with new tongues. Uh, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. Everything in Jesus' name, right? Amen? Amen. 
and they shall recover. In Luke 24, verses 45 to 49, Luke records Jesus' final words as this, that he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead uh, on the third day. And that re repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. And behold, Jesus said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. These are the words Jesus is saying. Notice, everything he's saying before he ascends up into heaven is about, you need to go out there and reach the lost. You need to go out there and be a witness. You need to go out there and preach the gospel. You need to go out there and baptize people in my name. You need to cast out devils. You need to speak in new tongues. Amen. You need to speak with tongues. Amen. It's the Holy Ghost sign. Hallelujah. Amen. When he said take up serpents, he wasn't talking about literally taking up serpents. I know there's churches that do that. That's not what he meant. That's not what he was talking about. We don't tempt the Lord God that way. He was saying, you're going to handle things. I mean, the devil is the ultimate example of the serpent, right? You're going to be able to handle the devil and, and really handle him. You know what I mean? Take a hold of him and do what you need to do with him. Uh, and, uh, well, I found out later, Paul, you know, really gives us an indication of what you do with serpents. Uh, when the viper came out of the wood and bit him on the hand, he shook it off in the fire. That's what I do. That's Amen. my policy. Amen. 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 You drink any deadly thing, it's not going to hurt you. And, and he opened their understanding of the scriptures and he told them, you need to go out there and be a witness. He goes on in John 20, verses 21 to 23, by John's record as saying this, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Listen, Jesus said, I was sent to reach the lost. Now I'm sending you to reach the lost. The mission hasn't changed. The purpose hasn't changed. The message hasn't changed. Amen. Right. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. They didn't get it right there, but it was a command. You need the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right. So if anybody's Amen. still unsure whether you need the Holy Ghost or not, John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus breathed on number 22, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. Right. Amen. Whosoever sins you remit, they shall be remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. He said, I'm going to give you power and authority with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of the gospel unlocks the door. And when you walk through that door with the keys to the kingdom like Peter had, you understand repentance and, and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Ghost is so very important. Acts 1 and 8, he says to those that are gathered at Bethany, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So watch this now. From the very beginning of his ministry to the very end of his ministry, Jesus was teaching them how to catch men. From the very beginning, from the fishing boats, as he called them and said, Peter, James, John, come and follow me. I want to teach you how to fish. I want to teach you how to catch men. That's what it's all about. Amen. There are people, and, and you know the word catching and the word fishing and all that that Jesus uses really is an indication of, of with a gospel message, with a message of hope. With the Holy Ghost moving on us, reaching to people and pulling them away from the jaws of sin and death and hell. It's catching them away. Yes. It's getting a hold of them. Amen. It's bringing their attention and their lives to the feet of Jesus Christ where the Lord can work a mighty work in their life. This is what it's all about, church. And you know, people are going to be saved. When we catch the vision and the heartbeat of God and we start reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. So these scriptures that I've read for you and, and the thought and the concept that they portray is known as the Great Commission. Right. And people talk about the Great Commission a lot. A lot of religions talk about the Great Commission. The Great Commission. 
Jesus didn't give us the Great Commission to talk about it or right. to scrutinize it or to uh -huh. analyze it. Uh -huh. He gave us the Great Commission to do it. Right. Yeah. It was a commission. These scriptures uh, culminate to a thought process that lets us know that it was a command of Jesus Christ for us to go out and do this thing, to reach the lost right. with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Sadly, however, the Great Commission often has become the Great Omission because we just don't do it. We convince ourselves that because we're doing something else that we're doing the will of God. We're preaching. We're uh, ministering. We're teaching Sunday school. Uh, we're running the projector. Uh, we're playing the piano. We're playing the guitar. We're playing the drums. We're singing. We're praise singer. Hey, I'm a praise singer. <laughs> you know? I'm a preacher. I mean, I'm doing the will of God. Listen, if if you are not reaching somebody, you're not doing the will of God. Right. Period. Yeah. <laughs> because that's the will of God. Mm -hmm. Great you can sing. Great you can preach. Great you can play. Great you can do things. Wonderful. That's great. And that aids and helps in the process of the, the in the building ministry. But most people aren't out there singing right. on the job. Well, some people do. Or playing an instrument, preaching. So we're not, you know, what we, what we acclaim as doing the will of God inside of a building that we call church, uh, we say that's the will of God, is not really accomplishing the real will of God, which is to reach somebody, the lost, with the gospel Amen. of Jesus Christ. Now listen, every born-again Christian knows it. You can't have the Holy Ghost and not feel a burden in it, right? For sure. Come on, how many have ever been in a place where you just felt a burden? For your family, or for, for a neighbor, or a friend, or somebody, you felt a burden. Without the Holy Ghost, you may not have that. But if you've got the Holy Ghost, you're going to feel that. Yeah. Most people have been taught about reaching somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many people have been through discipleship classes. And in those discipleship classes... We talk about the dynamics of being a witness and helping somebody. There have been some people have gone to seminars about it and they've learned about it and they can talk about it and they know the dynamics of it, but they're not really effectively catching men. They're not really effectively fishing for men. So yet, why with us knowing all of this do we find it so complicated and complex and perplexing and Difficult and even loathsome yeah. to reach somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do we find it so hard? Well, let me just emphasize one more time. From the beginning of his ministry to the end, everything Jesus did was about reaching souls with this gospel, with the love of God. It could have been a blind man. It could have been a woman who'd been married five times and was living with the man she was with, coming to the well at an off hour of the day. And he knew she'd be there and he met her there. Yeah. And he witnessed to her. Mm -hmm. she, she obviously had some idea of religion. She began to share that with him. And he began to say, really, you don't even know. You worship and you know not what. If you knew, he said, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, that was a Samaritan woman at the well, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd be asking me for a drink, and I'd give you something to drink, you'd never thirst again. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. It was Zacchaeus climbed up in the tree just to get a look at Jesus, and Jesus said, I knew you'd be there, and I'm coming to your house today. Right. It was the man who was let down before Jesus by his four friends, tore the roof off and let him down in front of Jesus because he needed a healing. And Jesus said, thy sins be forgiven thee. You understand what I'm saying? It wasn't about miracles and healings. They were all part of the plan, all part of the purpose. But the purpose was always to reach a soul. 
right. with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people are into the whole demon casting out thing. You understand what demon casting, you know what, what it means to cast out a devil? It means to save a soul. Right. That right, man that was right. on the other side of the lake as Jesus was teaching one day, I mean, I, I, I honestly believe that Jesus could hear the cries from across the lake. Sure. Not that anybody else could hear, but he heard him in the Holy Ghost. He heard him in the Spirit. Jumped on the boat, sailed across, met that demoniac man that nothing could help and nothing could change. And the man came running to Jesus, and before he got there, the devils were crying out for mercy. And Jesus said, goodbye, you're out of here. Yeah. And there he was, sitting, clothed in his right mind. It was about saving a soul. You understand, we make, we make the miraculous about the miraculous. Yeah. We make it something, and, and I know sometimes we praise God for it, but a lot of times we're kind of just talking about it. When in reality, every miracle, listen, the purpose hasn't changed. Every miracle God does, He does it to save a soul. Yeah. Every miraculous touch, every healing, every demon cast out, it's about saving a soul. The things that He's done in your own life, you might think it just God just brought you through and it's so wonderful. But listen, God just gave you a testimony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God just gave right. you right. a testimony. He gave you a testimony that you could tell somebody else about. I ask you tonight, how often have you simply shared your testimony of what God has done? Mm -hmm. Too many people, again, they make it too complex, too complicated, too loathsome of a task to try to reach somebody. And I know we've done it before, knocked on doors, everybody hates that. Passed out flyers, everybody hates that. Nobody wants to do Well, I shouldn't say everybody hates it, but you know what? A lot of people hate it. And they don't want to do it, and they're not going to do it. And you know what? That's fine. If you can't bring yourself to knock on a door with a group of church people going out, if you can't bring yourself to hang a flyer on somebody's screen door, uh, if you can't get involved in the outreach uh, efforts that we make as a church, then you better at least share what God has done in your life sure. with somebody else that doesn't know Him. Right. Because that's the purpose of everything God does in our lives. You know, we think it's just because He likes to bail us out, and He likes to help us out, and He likes to bless us and heal us and give us good things. That's wonderful. He's our daddy, and He loves to do that. But there's a difference between our daddy and every other daddy. Right. <laughs> Most daddies don't want their kids going around telling everything that their daddy's done for them. But this daddy wants you to. Yeah. You know why? Because he wants to do it for all of his kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And he wants them to know, those that don't even know they're a kid yet, of Jesus Christ. He wants them to know that he can bless them just like he blessed you. I'm, you know what I'm saying tonight? Come on. Right. Everybody needs to get the burden of reaching the lost with yes. the gospel Amen. of Jesus Christ. Because that's the purpose that Jesus lived for and died for. And that's why he called us into this church and into this ministry. Can I get an amen? Amen. So, um, when Jesus spent that earthly ministry in those times, what, what he was doing was saying, this is what I want you to do, and this is how I want you to do it. You know, we, we, can, uh, we can preach on... Jesus saying, the works that I do, you shall do also, and greater works than these shall you do, and the church will explode, and everybody be running around the aisles and shouting, they don't even know what they're shouting about. Right. Greater works than these shall you do. Well, what's he talking about? I, I mean, you can't, I mean, if somebody is healed of blindness, it, it doesn't get any better than that, right? I mean, right. when you can't see, and you can see, right. it doesn't, you can't be healed of blindness any greater way. If you couldn't walk, and all of a sudden you can now walk, right? I mean, aside from being able to run a marathon in record time, it really doesn't get any better than that, right? right? I right. couldn't walk, and now I can. I was blind, but now I see. Yeah. Those miracles, the works that I do, Jesus said, follow me now, watch. Yeah. You're going to do those works also. So, so he's saying, those things that, that you've seen me do, you've watched me do, I want you to understand, you're, you can do them. Yeah. Listen, every, every Holy Ghost anointed child of God, come on now, you have an authority in the name of Jesus. Right. Come on, you prayed for somebody and God answered that prayer. You were part of that miracle. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
If right. you prayed for them, you were part of that miracle. You might say, well, uh, well there's like 50 churches praying for them. Yeah, but if you prayed, you were part of the miracle, right? Mm -hmm. The works that I do, you're going to do also. And greater works than these shall you do. And what, he, what was he talking about? He was, I personally believe Jesus was talking about the reaching of the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he reached people personally. And he empowered the disciples to reach people. But not, not in the magnitude and the level that they did once they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Right. Mm -hmm. You shall receive power. Let me remind you, Acts 1 and 8. After the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth. I will make you fishers of men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I think part of the problem is some people just don't know how to fish. Right. <laughs> he said, I'll make you fishers of men. And some of y'all just have never learned how to fish. So I'm going to spend a couple of nights of Bible study teaching teaching you how to fish. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to call this series the Fishers of Men series, or Fishers of Men. And with the help of the Lord, I'm going to endeavor to teach you how to fish. Now, I'm going to give you a disclaimer, all right? Because I am going to use the principles of fishing, and specifically fly fishing. Uh, fly fishing for trout, even more specifically. So fly fishing for trout. I'm going to use this as my... Uh, example, my earthly example of heavenly teaching. Because Jesus, obviously, they were standing on a fishing boat right. when he said that to them. Yeah. They just let down their nets. They pulled up a draft of fish, and they were yeah. sitting there with their jaws hanging open. And Jesus <laughs> said, you follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Yeah. If you think you can fish like that, let me show you how to really fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello? Mm -hmm. and let me just say this on the onset. When you fish with Jesus, it's the best fishing you can ever have. Right. I mean, the best fishing days I've ever had in my life was fishing with Jesus. I'll never forget one time walking out on the stream in the early morning. I uh, dropped my son off from school. The job I was working uh, gave me some little flexible hours, so I was able to slip by the stream for about an hour before I started work. And, and uh, I, I knew there was some trout in the stream, and, and I walked over there, and, and sure enough, there were two guys right there where I wanted to be. And I knew, I, I'm just knowing there's a big rainbow trout in that hole. And I'm thinking, man, they're right there where I want to be. And so I got my boots on and got my rod out and got my equipment. And by the time I made my way over there, they had moved upstream a little bit. And I was like, I'm all right. <laughs> and so uh, I walked up, and, and they're standing there. And I said, yo, y'all mind if I throw in there? And he said, now nah, we've been fishing in there all morning, didn't catch a thing. I don't think there's any trout in there. And I'm not kidding you. Not kidding you. I, I tossed my bait out there and let it drift into the hole. And very first cast, man, I hooked an 18-inch rainbow. He was taking a drag out, <laughs> going down the creek and water flying. And, and uh, in the middle of this whole thing, I was hearing them talking about losing a big trout one time. So I just made my way down the stream on the bank a little bit and got down in the creek and, and continued to play and brought him in there and put him in the net. That guy said, man, I'm telling you, I can't believe that. And I said, well, that's the way you land a big fish now, fellas. And he said, I can't believe that. We fished that hole and we didn't catch anything. How'd you catch that trout? And I just looked at him and smiled and I said, I'm fishing with Jesus. <laughs> it probably sounded ignorant. I didn't mean it to be ignorant, but I just felt that way because I was like, God, just give me a great day. Uh, it was a beautiful morning. I got an hour here. I'm going to go out there just want to catch one fish, man. And I, I, I was so happy. Uh, but fishing with Jesus makes all the difference in the world. It's funny, isn't it? Because at the beginning of their calling, they were fishing without Jesus and caught nothing. Right. And when Jesus stepped on the boat, he said, let down your nets for a draft. And they let down their nets, and they couldn't even hit. Broke their nets. They called the other boat over. Everybody filled two boats full of fish. A ton of fish. Yeah. A draft of fish. And Jesus said, come on, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And it's funny, because at the end, you know, he dies on the cross. He, he's buried in the tomb. And Peter said, well, you know what, guys? I'll tell you what. This is a rotten day. Yeah. I'm telling you what I'm doing. I'm going fishing. <laughs> And, and the other disciples went with him. It appears though several of the disciples were out there 
fishing on that boat all night long. I mean, it's like the greatest deja vu in history, you know? <laughs> They're fishing all night long, and then, then there's this man on the shore. He's got a little fire burning, and, and he hollers out to the boats. They're sitting there, you know, like, man, that was a waste of time. Toiling all night long, caught nothing. And, and Jesus says, do you have any meat? <laughs> like, rub it in a little bit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they, yeah, we've been fishing all night, got nothing. Jesus said, let down your nets on the other side of the boat. Now, now seriously, when you think about this situation, they had probably fished both sides. It's not like they were dumb enough to only fish one side of the boat. So, but he happened to observe them fishing on the one side, so he just said, let them, let them down on the other side. And this time it wasn't so much as many fish, but the huge fish they caught. Yeah. Huge fish. That's, I think even numbers like 150. Huge fish. And they're like, ah, the boat's going, mm -hmm. You're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> huge fish. And, and then they, and then all of a sudden, John looks at Peter mm -hmm. and says, it's the Lord. <laughs> Something hits him like. All of a sudden he realizes, now this this is really like familiar. Like like this happened. Oh my Jesus. Yeah. 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 It's the Lord. Peter literally jumps in the water and swims to the shore and he gets to Jesus. And there's Jesus with fish cooking on the fire. Now I don't think Jesus, I know he's resurrected from the tomb and he's got all power in heaven and earth. But I highly doubt if he just went and there was fish burning on the fire. I'd have to believe that he made a little effort and caught some fish. He knew where the fish were. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd like to tell you tonight, Jesus knows where the fish are. And he knows where we need to be fishing. Right. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Come on. Yeah. And there's no point in fishing in somebody else's pond <laughs> when the Lord has called you to fish where you are. Right. Mm -hmm. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to teach on fishing. I'm going to use biblical concepts of catching men and relate them to natural concepts of catching trout. Now, at some point in this series, I know somebody's going to get inspired to go fly fishing. And I've thought about that. <laughs> this has happened many times through the years of ministry. Uh, I've had profound Bible studies on incredible topics. I remember very much as a young preacher working in the insurance industry, I'll never forget teaching a Bible study one time on an immediate estate, and I likened it unto life insurance, that you can be newly married, which I was. And it was interesting because working in the insurance industry at the time, I'm meeting with our life insurance representative and getting married, I thought it would be a wise thing to have some life insurance to protect my new family, my new wife. And, and he said, well, you know, the guy told me he's a... Uh, uh, said, Phil, you know, this, this is a great thing because when you buy life insurance, you have an immediate estate. And I thought, well, that's a pretty cool thought. Yeah. And then I got to thinking, you know, when, when you come to Jesus and, and you repent of your sins and, and you're baptized in Jesus' name and you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you have an immediate estate because Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you over there. Right. So I teach this whole Bible study on an immediate estate and how when you come to the Lord, you got nothing, but he gives you everything. And I go through the whole Bible study, and like half a dozen people after church come up and say, can I talk to you about life insurance? I was like, I just wondering, because I don't have any. Yet. And so I know that happens. So I know, I know there's going to be somebody out there, as I start teaching this, they're going to be like, man, he really, he knows how to fish. And I'm going to ask brothers up. I'm going to ask pastor. I'm going to ask him if he'll teach me how to fish. And I will. I will take you fishing, and I will teach you how to fish for a fee. Yeah. Because that's one of my retirement projects. It's another one of my little retirement projects that I'm kind of getting started. Uh, so one of my potential uh, retirement projects is doing a little bit of a fishing guide service. Yeah. And uh, taking people fishing, because uh, I view myself as somewhat of a professional, right. uh, knowing a little bit. Um, and I've taken people. Uh, I could drop names for you big name preachers and others that I've taken fishing and they've caught fish. So um, so I will take you fishing um, and teach you how to fish for a fee. Um, but what I really want you to get out of this is a desire to reach somebody for Jesus. 
be a fisher man. Amen. I hope that's what you learn out of this. Uh, in the process, you might learn some fishing techniques. I shall not disclose all my secrets um, <laughs> because if you disclose it, it's no longer a secret. Uh, so, but I will share that knowledge uh, for those who are willing. <laughs> now, let me give you a little bit of qualification. I hope this is all right tonight. Um, this is my introductory uh, aspect of this Bible study, but I feel like it, it'd be important that I give you give you a little bit of my qualifications. Um, every now and then, I think it's good to do that. So first, um, let me give you my qualifications as a fisherman. Um, I've been seriously, like a serious trout fisherman for about 30 years. Serious trout fisherman. Uh, I've... Uh, I spent some time in the past 10 years developing my fly fishing skills, uh, which I can't say I've mastered, but uh, my, my last fly fishing trip uh, produced uh, 11 trout, 10 brown trout and a brook trout uh, in crystal clear water on a uh, morning about 8, 8.30 in the morning uh, for about two hours. I caught like 11 trout, so uh, I felt like I graduated another level. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thanks to my good friend Bobby Lewis, missionary to Germany. Uh, helped me out with a uh, zebra midge. Uh, man, this is just like magic. Um, so, um, but, so I've been fishing for about 30 years, 10 years about fly fishing. Now, um, prior to that 30-year um, period, um, I was a kid who either didn't pay much attention to my father, who was a great fisherman, or I just didn't get it because I really was not a very successful fisherman. Um, I'd go out and fish and I'd catch one or two. In fact, there are places I'd go and I knew it was a two fish limit. If I caught two fish, I might as well quit and go home. Uh, if it took me five minutes or two hours, I could fish all day. Two fish was all I was going to catch. I didn't know it, it was a curse. Uh, but ultimately, at one point, I finally decided that um, it, going fishing was unproductive and therefore I quit doing it. Um, so I didn't go fishing at all for a while. Um, then I met, I met a friend, a co-worker. And uh, for the sake of his privacy, I won't mention his name because then you'll all be trying to get a hold of him and ask him to teach you how to fish, uh, which I've instructed him that he should charge for his services as well. Uh, so you would have to pay anyhow. Um, nevertheless, my good friend um, was talking one day at work about going fishing and fishing for trout and how he was catching these ridiculous numbers of brook trout. And I, I, I said, come on, man, there's no way you're catching that many fish. And he said, I'm serious, I am. I can tell you right where they are. Uh, and I can tell you where it is because they don't. They, there's no fishing there anymore. It's way back in the mountain. You probably wouldn't be able to find it. It was a stream called Old Town Run, a little narrow stream way back in the mountain. So he's telling me about these fish, and I was like, I said, there is no way. So he kept talking about it. So one day I said, all right, fine. I'm going to call you. I'm going to call your bluff on this one. So I went down to our boss, and I said, hey, listen, I'd like to take a half day off work. And he said, okay, is everything okay? I said, yeah, but, you know, a well, buddy out here is telling me about catching all these brook trout, and, and I'm, I want to go try to catch some. He said, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I took a half day off work. I went over and bought myself a new new reel with this, that blue monofilament line. I'm telling you, I didn't know a whole lot. Um, the new new reel and put it on one of my old rods, and, and he had given me a couple of these little minnow rigs, you know, you put a live minnow on and told me about how you fish this minnow rig, and, and I, I, was, I was like, I was like semi-excited, but very skeptical, and and uh, drove my way on way back, and I'm thinking, oh, good grief, man, I'm on a wild goose chase. Drive back, fill to the bridge. When you get to that bridge, park your car, and right below the bridge, he said, you'll walk out there, and you'll look in, and you'll see them. You'll see the trout laying there right below the bridge. So I got there and parked my truck and got out, walked over and looked over the bridge, and my jaw hit the stream. I mean, it's like, you know, nine feet down, and my jaw literally whoosh in the water. And and I was like, holy cow. So I got my, I got my minutes, got my rod, and I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm, I'm just, now I'm nervous because I, I know there's trout there. I can see them in the stream. You didn't have to have the special, you know, Babe Winkleman glasses or anything. You know, you could see them in the stream. So, so I, I get on down there, and I tie that minnow rig on and I put one of those minnows on, and, and I, I throw it down in, just like you told me, throw it down off kind of the side and let it drift in there. To, and, man, it was, I mean, they were chewing the minnows up. I couldn't even hook anything for the first 15 minutes, probably. I was missing, I didn't even, man, they were like, <laughs> chewing up my minnows. I finally got the hang of it, and I caught six brook trout in 25 minutes. 
And I was just stunned. I, I mean, I, I had never in my life fished like that. But, but I was hooked. <laughs> Pun intended, I was hooked. <laughs> and from that day forward, um, just began to work on those skills. And I've, I've read some books and, and, and uh, trout fishing and developed techniques. And, and I could say that through those... For the last 30 years, I've developed some skills, and I've caught some trout. Um, I've caught quite a few trout. I've had some days on the stream where uh, I've caught a lot of trout. Uh, Brother Frankfurt was with me one day. Josh has been with me already on some of those days. Uh, shared some of those skills with Brother Frankfurt. I think one day we were out. What was it, Brother Frankfurt? I think I caught 40, and you caught 25. Somewhere. Somewhere or 30. You got no. no, not 30. So in that neighborhood there. 30, I caught 30, you caught 20, I don't know, is it? It was a lot. But I know, I've, I know I've caught more than 40 trout in one day. The point is, we caught an enormous, and I'm not telling fish stories now, I'm telling you the truth. We caught an enormous amount of fish, and we've caught some trout, all right? And I, I'm not up here trying to brag, I'm not trying to tell I'm just saying, I know a little bit about fishing. So when I, when I talk about fishing, I'm not just uh, getting some things that I've read in a book somewhere, or Field and Stream magazine, or Pat McManus even. Uh, I'm telling you the truth, I, I can catch some fish. Um, and so that's my qualifications as a fisherman. Um, in fact, I, I even caught one trout three times, the same trout. Huge 18-inch rainbow trout. I caught him once, he broke my line. I caught him again, he broke my line. And he said, well, how can you possibly know it was the same trout? The second time he broke my line, I had a split shank treble hook on. So I knew the type of hook it was. And I knew the hole he was in. And the third time I caught him, I was smart and brought him downstream and landed him. And I, I, when I got him in and got him in the net, opened his mouth, all three of my hooks were in there. <laughs> so I knew it was the same trout. So that's you learn things that way. So enough about my fishing exploits. Let me just give you a little bit of my qualifications as a soul winner because that's what's really most important here. Uh, and again, I'm not really going to talk numbers. Um, I probably shouldn't even talk fishing numbers because right now I probably my I probably my phone is on do not disturb. I guarantee I'll probably have three or four texts from guys saying, "Brother Zuck, I want to sign up." Um, it's going to cost you. All right, <laughs> now I'll tell you this: I'm not going to charge you for anything about reaching souls. I know some dumb people who've done that, um, but I'm not going to do that. Um, none of the soul willing stuff. I'm going to do that for free because that's kingdom business. Amen. I'm not going to make merchandise of the gospel. Amen. Amen. But let me just tell you, for, now I'll be honest with you. For the first, I don't even know how many years of my walk with God, I, I won hardly anybody to I caught nobody. I, I, very few. Um, I'm trying to go back through my recollection. I was thinking about this Bible study, and, and I was trying to go back through recollection. But in those early years of, of serving the Lord as a, as a uh, uh, preteen, and I mean, I came in, I was basically just a little bit before I was 10 years old, uh, so, you know, in, even through my teenage years, um, I feel like I, by the time I was in junior high, or I'm not, not junior high, but uh, uh, junior year of high school and senior year, I feel like I've had a little bit of an impact, but I can't say that I really won any of my classmates to the Lord, and I'm, I regret that. Uh, but there was a time in my life where I, uh, I, I felt very ineffective as a Christian and as a, as a witness. Um, but I will say, when I started teaching home Bible studies, um, I started, I started winning, I started catching some people. Uh, and I'm totally convinced that teaching home Bible studies is, is still one of the most effective ways right. to catch people, to catch souls, to catch men, to win people to Jesus Christ. It's an incredibly effective, especially, I, I'll say from, from personal experience, my wife and I teaching Bible studies uh, has been extremely successful. Um, so since that time in planting the church here in Chambersburg, starting in 1995, of course, as a pastor, you feel this obligation uh, to reach the loss. You're pastoring now, and you know, if you didn't feel it before, now you feel it. Um, uh, and I wish I would have felt that kind of burden long before. Uh, but since that time, I can say that, I, that I've caught, caught quite a few people for the Lord. Um, and I've caught a couple here and a couple there, and I've even caught a couple at a time. Um, there have been pairs of fish. Um, and there have been a couple times where I got into a whole school of men <laughs> and women and children and caught a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah. At one time, it was uh, we've had some incredible, uh, many revivals of people that just started out uh, coming and then brought others and brought others, and we talked Bible studies and baptized. I, I remember a couple different times baptizing six people at a time. 
uh, just uh, that was several times that happened, baptizing six people at a time that were taught Bible studies that, that I personally was able to, to reach. Um, so uh, what I learned through the years is that is that there are principles in catching fish that really have some similarities to catching men. And so I'm going to endeavor over the next couple of weeks to use some of those things that I've learned uh, to help somebody. Now, let me just say, if anybody thinks that what I'm trying to say right now, what I've said over the last few minutes is, is in some manner of, of bragging, I want you to know it is not, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm just not there. I'm not that kind of person. I'm not that kind of minister. Uh, God taught me about humility a long, 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 long time ago. Uh, and he taught me how that he receives the glory. He receives the honor. But there are times when it's good to give some credentials so that when you speak, people know that you're, you're, you're not a novice. You, you've been doing this and you know a little bit. And I want to help you. I want to help you reach some people. Um, so we're going to endeavor over the next few weeks to, to apply some of these principles and, uh, and understand the concepts of reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's interesting because the other example Jesus uses in reaching people is the example of farming. And I'll, I will tell you, most farmers are also, most successful farmers are also very successful fishermen. I don't know how it goes hand in hand, but it's interesting that Jesus uses the examples of farming and fishing when it comes to reaching the lost. And, and I'll tell you at the onset, and I'm going to wrap up here for tonight, and we're going to get into some nitty-gritty next time we get together. But let me just say this one thing. Um, when Jesus talked to the Pharisees one day, he said, you know, you, you're really a bunch of hypocrites because you can look at the sky and know when it's a good time to sow. You can look at the climate and know when it's a good time to reap. And you know the laws of harvest uh, sowing and reaping. But he said, you can't discern the times. He said, it's really sad. I wish you could read the times like you read the sky. Yeah. And it's interesting because when it comes to fishing, you really need to understand climate when it comes to fishing. Uh, I just went by one of the streams that I fished today. Major thunderstorm blew through last night. I don't even know if we had tornadoes. It was really bad. Some of you probably experienced that storm. Uh, that blew through, and I drove by one of the streams I was fishing. It's like chocolate milk. And there's no point in going fishing. Don, you can go fishing if you want, and all you're going to do is stand on the bank or wade in the water. Um, the only way you have a hope of catching a trout is if you've got some god-awful smelling power bait, <laughs> and he somehow uh, stumbles upon it. Or, I don't know how the fish stumble, but, you know... <laughs> He flips his fins upon it somehow and manages to, to get it in his mouth because I'm telling you, just that's not the time. Climate-wise, you know, there, there and, and when you learn about fishing, you'll learn that there's there's just there's times and it's just not a good time to go fishing. And when it comes to reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are times when we should sow the seed. The Bible talks about that. We should continue to reach people and do our... But there are times when we know, there are environments that we know that if we try to say something, right? Mm -hmm. It's just not the right time. Right. It's just not the right season. The climate isn't right. The stream conditions aren't right. right. It's not a matter of whether the fish are biting or not. If the, if the stream is that cloudy with mud, they aren't even going to see it. But I will tell you right now, I close with this thought, I will tell you right now that we are in a climate and a season where it's time to go fishing, folks. I said it's time to go fishing. I know we got coronavirus and we've got civil unrest, but trust me, I feel like the Lord has stirred some things up. One of the greatest times to go fishing is following uh, a storm or a rain. That's enough to start some influx of some of the groundwater into the stream because it, it washes some of the bugs and, and, and some of those beetles that are, that are in the stream bed and under the rocks and the water. Wash, it washes them out in there. And once that, once that stream starts filling up with some of those stone flies and nymphs that are, that are in there, the water gets stirred up a little bit. And it comes down. I'm telling you, 
trout, get, they just get all excited about that. And I feel like the Lord's been stirring some things up lately. Amen. And I feel like he's been, the Holy Ghost has been moving. And I feel like if we can just get the right bait out there where the fish are, we're going to catch some people. We're going to catch some men. Amen. How many are with me tonight? Amen. How many are excited about it? There are times when I've just been biting at the bit to get out fishing because I knew, I just, I just knew. I remember one time I, I, I just knew I, I, there was this place, this hole, and I knew they put some trout in there and people went by it. It was a hard place to fish. You got a fish back in under the brush, and I kept thinking. I, I think I even told Brother Frankfurt about, it, told Josh about. It. I'm gonna get down there, call it the brickyard. I'm gonna get down there, just feel like I went down there, and I, 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 was, I was praying. I said, God, just give me a good day, make it a good day, let me catch some fish. I stood there, barely moved, and caught 25 trout. In fact, while I was fishing, they brought fish down and threw them in the stream. And I just kept catching them. And because I just had that feeling, today's a good day to go fishing. Are you hearing me right now? Yeah. I'm hearing, listen, it's not a good day to go for trout. But it is a good day to go for men. Amen. It's time to go and reach some people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Could you stand where you are right now and just lift your hands? I want to pray for you. God, I thank you tonight. I thank you for the experience that you've given me, God. I hope people don't think I'm trying to boast because my soul makes its boast in the Lord. And I even feel like even some of my best fishing days, Lord, is only because you blessed me. And you gave me some experience, God. And reaching people has been such a joy. And I want to do it more, Lord. I want to see some more reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But stir up the stream bed, God. And stir up our hearts, Lord Jesus. And help us to realize that now is the time to go fishing. Now is the time to get out there on the stream and reach somebody for Jesus Christ. I pray your blessings be upon us. I pray, God, even tomorrow as we get up and start our day, we'd see some hungry fish, Lord, and we would have the bait that they're looking for. And, Lord, that we'd catch somebody even tomorrow, Lord. Let it be so. Let it be so, Lord, that we catch somebody and win them to the Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for your people. I thank you for your church, God. I pray your blessings upon each and every one. Give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, God bless you, everybody. This is your pastor signing off for tonight, Wednesday Live. God bless you.